Well, John, I don't know if that's good or bad. You kind of didn't put the disclaimer out there. <laughs> I'm Linda Reinstein. I'm the executive director of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. But most importantly, I'm just like you folks. I'm a Manhattan Beach resident and a mom. And I want to tell you that seven years ago, I thought my life was absolutely perfect. Um, and I was just living the Manhattan Beach dream with my family, thinking about just being a PTA mom and classroom mom and all that exciting stuff that for we as women really embrace. But today I want to share with you a secret part of my life and some of my feelings in hopes that my journey will inspire you to seek truth and challenge life and make change happen. I am that kind of girl that could never stand in line in school, so I'm a little bit of a rogue creator, and I'm delighted to be in this panel, John, with the signs actually on, uh, vertically presented. Now, I want, for some of you, you may have remembered my husband. In 2003, um, Alan, we were married for 20 years. We were in Hawaii, and he had this slight persistent cough that, that kept going and some weight loss, which I'd never seen before. So casually at dinner, I just in, suggested that he call his doctor and make an appointment for that routine physical. Well, that physical was shattering. It, re it revealed a pleural effusion, which for those of you outside the medical world, which was where we once were, is fluid between the lining of the lung and the lung itself. Well, Alan had tests and more tests and more tests. And for those of you who may have navigated the medical system for yourself or a loved one, you'll know that the old adage, what you don't know can't hurt you, may be very wrong. Well, Alan's nine months of misdiagnosed symptoms led to surgery. And when the thoracic surgeon came outside and asked, me, asked to speak with me, but he also said, are you alone? My heart stopped. He said that Alan had a type of cancer, mesothelioma, caused only from asbestos. I looked and cried. And like every other person that's diagnosed, I'd never heard of mesothelioma. I couldn't pronounce it. And worse yet, I found that there was no cure. Well, these are those sharp, spindly, odorless, invisible, tasteless fibers that when inhaled or swallowed, cause permanent damage. We grappled with the fact of Alan's diagnosis and treatment, but more importantly, we wondered why. How is he exposed? We live in an urban area. Alan wasn't a blue-collar worker. He'd worn a suit and tie to work forever. The more research we did, the more we found out that asbestos caused, causes diseases, and not just mesothelioma, all of them deadly. Alan's disease came with a, a tag of 6 to 12 months from diagnosis to death something that a father with a 10-year-old girl shuddered to read. Well, when we first were doing our research, I was obviously overwhelmed and bewildered and grief-stricken. And I searched the web like every other spouse for medical information. And we know the web is not always true to its form. But what I found interesting is wh what, where I was getting the most information wasn't from the CDC or our government agencies, but it was from plaintiff websites. Still confused, I wondered what happened there, and it turned out mesothelioma is highly litigated. At that time, I was grateful for information. Again, I'd never heard of this disease. We faced aggressive treatment options and didn't know where to turn. The feelings of isolation consumed us. So looking back, I'm grateful to those, those plaintiff websites that shortened my learning curve. But it wasn't a perfect scenario. Uh, but those reeling in chaos of the terminal disease, it was a stopgap. Well, you can see there that Alan did have the surgery. They removed his left lung, his pericardium, and replaced his diagram. It looked like a shark had mauled him to death. He did survive the surgery, learned to live with one lung, and we as a family began to heal. Well, our journey could have stopped there. And maybe for some people, we should have. And at times, I look back and think, well, maybe we, we should have also do, just done that. But we didn't. We continued on. We wanted to know what caused this and how could we stop other families from having to endure the horror that we had to. Well, it was a year later. And I remember like it was yesterday. It was very cute. Emily was just 11. And as those of us in Manhattan Beach were quite proud of the education they get in our schools. And we create creative thinkers. And she says, Mom, I want to go to Washington. And I want to tell Senators Boxer and Senator Feinstein how, old, how hard it is for a girl who's just 11 to watch her dad suffer. Well, that's all I had to hear, because I, I thought about Wayne Gretzky's quote, that, that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 
And at that time, we were already facing a terminal disease, and it was a shot not for Alan or our family, but for the thousands of Alans and the other people around the country that we needed to go to Washington. And at that time, looking back, I had no clue how our life would change. That's my sweet Emily signing I love you to her father. We booked those appointments, and we traipsed through the hills. We had unconventional meetings. We took a photograph and set it on the desk. I'm not a lobbyist or an attorney, and I'm not a public speaker. I'm a mom with a, on a mission with a daughter who loved her father. We sat that photograph on their desk, and we said, because of asbestos exposure, Alan and Emily may not share those special father-daughter dances in the future, and we thought something should change. Well, we have a family motto, a motto and it's called Reinstein's Never Give Up. Gave me straight strength to, to think creatively, but I also remembered Einstein's definition of insanity, which continually to, to wash my mind over and over again. How could we know what we know with 100 years of, of documentation and information, know that asbestos exposure could, could kill and let history repeat itself? It was unbearable for us, so we knew something had to be changed. Well, we, when we were in D.C., it didn't matter if we were standing in line for a Starbucks coffee or waiting for a taxi on our first trip. Everywhere I went, somebody would say, are you just here for vacation? And we said, no, we're here to speak to our legislators because our husband, my husband is very ill. And I'd explain to them about Alan's mesothelioma diagnosis. And one by one, people would say, it happened to Uncle Harry. It happened to my mother. It happened to my brother. I wasn't out to do reconnaissance missions, but what I did realize is it wasn't a fallacy, as I had, been, as I had read, that asbestos diseases were rare. Indeed, it was a fact. It was a, it was a fallacy. It was a fact that they were not rare, but just underreported, that there were millions of people out there over the last 100 years that have had a lung, lung cancer, a non-malignant disease, or mesothelioma take their lives from around the world. Well, Alan fought a very hard, courageous three-year mesothelioma battle, and he lost. We used to run marathons around California and also in New York. And at the end of a marathon, you get a medal around your neck. Well, fighting mesothelioma may feel like a, medal, a marathon to those patients and their families, but there is no medal at the end. And I remember, just like yesterday, when, Alan, when Emily and I stood with Alan as he took his final breaths, and my very brave daughter said to her father and as she comforted him, Dad, you, you're a champ. You won. You never gave up. I looked remarkably at that young girl's courage and realized that we would need to continue our work. Alan did give us the greatest gift of all, which was more time. But I stood in that proverbial fork in the road position thinking, what now? Alan's gone. Do we just give up with asbestos and mesothelioma? The pain was unbearable. I was 50, a widow, and a single mother to a 13-year-old. I just thought I couldn't bear it. Life without Alan was hard enough, and it still is. But I remember that Emily and I had promised to Alan that we would continue our work until there was a ban. So we did. We, as, as they say, we went to back to our family motto that Reinsteins don't give up, and we persevered. We've now become the largest asbestos victims organization in the United States. We have a science advisory board led by a former assistant surgeon general. We have the ears now of those in the Senate and government agencies like the World Health Organization, the EPA, the, the, the ILO, and OSHA. We have a message that's being heard, but I've also learned along the way the glacially slow pace of public policy. Now, I want you to take a close look at this slide. It was very interesting because John actually brought this slide over, and I looked at him. I thought, John, how did you find this? Google. Well, what John found, and I've had on my computer, is a 1978 advertisement for asbestos. Now, stay with me. Over 100 years, they knew asbestos exposure would cause disease and deaths. They're touting that this magic mineral indeed would be a fabulous product for the World Trade Center. And yes, they sprayed 40 floors with asbestos in the World Trade Center. Yes. Oh. 400 tons of pulverized asbestos came tumbling down on 9-11. On, um, it was a national tragedy. My friend was a pilot that went into the from Boston that went into the first World Trade Tower. 
And as I consoled my friend Peggy, who had three children, I had no clue at that time what was going to unfold, because Alan was diagnosed in 03. There's already a 9-11 cough in New York. <coughs> That's the cough. That's the cough Alan had. That's the cough that went undiagnosed. It'll take 20 to 50 years to truly tally up the sick people and, 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 and log the deaths caused from asbestos. And all along, industry knew, and so did government. Well, there are some sweet messages along the way. We had no idea that we would dedicate our life to fighting asbestos-caused diseases. In fact, we had no idea that some of our friends here today, like Mayor Portia Gowen in the back, and other people around the world would join our fight. And we in Manhattan Beach should be very proud of our city council, because just in October, they actually passed a resolution urging our California lawmakers to drop our California state rock of serpentine, which is the host rock of asbestos, named by lobbyists. So I want you to think about the message of education, of community, and advocacy, and recognize what people can do when like-minded individuals can come together for change. Now, media advocacy and social media are powerful, and they have moved ADIO light years in front. As all of you know, if you watched John's video just a few minutes ago, it is beyond powerful. And your, your message isn't, has no meaning. If, your voice has no meaning if your message isn't heard. So at ADIO, we use a lot of publicity to generate interest with, the, with Congress, the media, and, and the public. Because we do know that by inhaling and swallowing these fibers, there will be no cure for these diseases, and there will be families left behind. This is the fun part. I love networking. I think social media is just exhilarating. And I think I'm just hardwired for advocacy, too. So this just fits into my space altogether. Sorry for the pun. It's up there. I didn't notice. But anyway, um, Facebook alone allows you to connect with millions of people around the world with clicks and keyboards. You can do fundraising, recruit volunteers, e-blast messages, communicate privately, and show a force of how many members you have to people in Congress or in the community, all for free at any time of the day. For those of you who may be grappling with something of change in your world, whether it's as small as a, as a learning disorder that you may be feeling with your, with, with your child and your family, or maybe it's a bigger issue that you see in your workplace or maybe in your community or world, change <coughs> can start with a voice. And I would encourage you to step back in your own lives. See and feel the power of change and messaging and unity and embrace those opportunities to make a difference. For me, there is no rewind button in my life. I can't go back. I can only go forward. And I live and love life, and I encourage you also to live with zeal and passion. And when you maybe hit that wall, as a marathon runner often does, at mile 18, although you have 26.2 ahead of you, Sometimes you bend over and you grab some, some, some special Gatorade drink to finish the course. And I remember Alan and I hitting the wall when we ran the New York Marathon. But you have to draw from your inner strength and know that if you can proceed on your course that you believe in, that change can follow. I love and live by Margaret Mead's quote because I think it's really a powerful statement. And for the sake of getting it right, I'm going to read it just so that I don't get myself nervous. Never under underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world, because in fact, that's the only thing that ever has. And I encourage you to, to step up today to change, to challenge, and, to, and the courage to make our community and world a better place. Thank you.